Hi there, I'm John, and this is part two of fluids and electrolytes. I hope that before you will play this clip, you were able to watch the first part of fluids and electrolyte discussion. So for this time, I'll be talking about electrolyte disturbances. Okay, to start, when you say electrolytes, electrolytes are actually charged minerals. Remember, when you say an electrolyte that is positively charged, we name that as your cation, right? And if the electrolyte is negatively charged, we name that as your anion. Now, in your examination, I want you to familiarize with common electrolytes as well as their normal values, as well as those common things that may come out in your nursing qualifying examinations. So let me enumerate the different electrolytes that you need to remember as well as their normal values, okay? So first is what we call your sodium. The normal sodium level ranges from 135 to 145 millimole per liter okay the second electrolyte is what we call your potassium the normal potassium level ranges from 3.5 to 5.0 milli equivalent per liter other book it's 3.5 to 5.5 another electrolyte is what we call your calcium the normal calcium level ranges from 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter Another electrolyte is your phosphate. The normal phosphate level ranges from 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. Again, it's 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And the last electrolyte that you need to remember is your magnesium. The normal magnesium level ranges from 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. It's 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter other book it's 1.8 to 2.7 now reminder these are common electrolytes that you need to remember please do not forget that when you talk about electrolytes they usually link this with the different disorders or diseases with your examination please pay attention on common ECD tracing of different electrolyte imbalances okay now we will start our, dis our, our discussion with sodium imbalances Now, reminder that sodium is a form of an extracellular cation. In short, sodium can be found more or okay, abundantly outside the cell, and sodium is a form of a positively charged electrolyte. Now, sodium as an electrolyte promotes water retention. That is why if there's too much sodium, water retains. Am I right? Now, there is a specific hormone that regulates sodium secretion. And this hormone, when this hormone is so high, hypernatremia follows. And if this hormone is so low, it can cause hyponatremia. And that hormone is so important in your exam. That hormone is what we call aldosterone. Another name for aldosterone is what we call mineralocorticoid. Again, we call this a sure mineralocorticoid. Corticoid. Now, what structure in the body produces aldosterone? Answer, it is your adrenal gland, particularly your adrenal cortex. Now, remember I said aldosterone. I mentioned that if there is an increase in your aldosterone, an increase in your aldosterone, this will result to hypernatremia. And a decrease in your aldosterone would also result to hyponatremia. So do not forget this. Increased aldosterone will give you hypernatremia. Decreased aldosterone will give you hyponatremia. In your examination, sodium imbalances or sodium disturbances is usually linked or associated with ADH abnormalities or ADH imbalances. Now when I say ADH, ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. Or another name for this is what we call your vasopressin. The reminder that your ADH is a hormone produced by the posterior pituitary gland or also called neurohypothesis. What is the importance or relevance of your antidiuretic hormone? Your ADH or vasopressin is a hormone important for water reabsorption. Okay, so there's too much antidiuretic hormone more water is being reabsorbed. Now, ADH abnormalities or ADH imbalances, they come in two forms. And these two forms are the following. Hypersecretion of ADH is referred as your or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. 
hyposecretion of anti-diuretic hormone or vasopressin is referred as your diabetes insipidus. Please do not forget this. Now, in your examination, sometimes you will be asked, okay, who among patients below are at risk to develop SIAD? Who among patients below are at risk to have DI? Or who among options below are at risk to have ADH abnormalities? Remember, your ADH abnormalities, actually, it is idiopathic. It has an unknown cause. But mind you, this condition is related to patient who had head, head surgery or to patient who had head injury. That is why if you be asked in your exam, who among options or patients below are at risk to have ADH abnormalities, look for an option that has something to do with head injury or head trauma or head surgery now in your in your examination you have to be very particular what specific sodium imbalance you will encounter for patient with SIAD and what type of sodium imbalance you will get if you have diabetes insipidus this is the thing you need to figure out okay now what are we going to do here is that we are going to divide our board into two sides the left side and on the right side on the left side we will be talking about hypersecretion and that is what they call your SIAD on the right side, we'll be talking about hyposecretion, and that is what they call your diabetes insipidus. Okay, look, this is now the left side, and this is the right side. Reminder, left side is hypersecretion of antidiuretic hormone referred as your syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. On the right side is your hyposecretion of ADH. This will result to a disorder called diabetes insipidus. Now, you try to analyze. If syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone has an increase or hyper secretion of ADH, and we know for the fact that ADH promotes water reabsorption, therefore inside more water is being reabsorbed, right? Therefore, if there's too much water being reabsorbed, what do you think is the most appropriate nursing diagnosis for patient with this condition? Knowing that there is excessive water reabsorption. Answer, there will be fluid volume excess. So do not forget this. This condition will result to fluid volume excess. But for patient with diabetes insipidus because of hypo secretion of ADH, less water is being reabsorbed. As a result, this condition will lead to fluid volume deficit. Guess what? These are actually highlights in your examination. Okay? Now, these two different disorders or opposing disorders, they have specific features. So we need to identify common features of patient with SIAD and common features of patient with diabetes insipidus. So again, there are three common features. The first feature for patient with SIAD, you try to analyze. Remember that there is fluid volume excess. There's too much water, right? Therefore, if there's too much water, what will happen to your blood? If you put a lot of water, okay, if your blood has a lot of water in it, what will happen to your blood? Concentrated or diluted? What do you think is the best answer? Of course, it's diluted, right? So the first feature for patient with SIAD will be hemodilution. Please do not forget this. Hemodilution. Question. What specific tests or laboratory data will supplement or confirm that indeed there is hemodilution? Answer, hematocrit. So what will be the result in your hematocrit if the blood is diluted? Will there be an increase in the hematocrit or a decrease in the hematocrit? Answer, hemodilution is represented as decreased hematocrit in the blood. So please do not forget this. A decrease in the hematocrit would mean hemodilution. The second feature, the second feature for patient with SIAD will be hyponatremia. So please not forget this. Hyponatremia. Now, why do we have hyponatremia? Hyponatremia is due to hemodilution. Can you follow? Now, let me let, let, let try to expound it more. When you say hemodilution, remember that your blood is diluted. There's too much water in it, right? Therefore, if the blood has a lot of water, the sodium in the blood is also diluted. Therefore, the reason why patient develops hyponatremia is not due to sodium deficiency. The reason why you have hyponatremia is due to hemodilution. That is why the most appropriate term there will be diluted hyponatremia. This is the second feature for patient with SIAD. The third and last feature for patient with SIAD will be urine, urine concentration. Sir, question. Why is the urine of the patient concentrated? 
And what specific test would reveal that the urine is indeed concentrated? Answer, it will be your urine-specific gravity. So if the urine is concentrated, what will be the result in your urine-specific gravity? Will there be an increase or decrease? What do you think is the answer? Answer will be an increase in the urine-specific gravity. Let's go back to the first question. Why is the urine concentrated? Okay, the urine is concentrated because of too much water. Okay, too much water being reabsorbed. Now, expound. Let's say that this is the blood vessel of the patient. This will be the kidney. Am I right? The output, of course, is what we call is what we call urine. In your sciad, remember that there is hyper secretion of antidiuretic hormone. And remember, I said that antidiuretic hormone is important for water re are reabsorption. In short, if there's too much antidiuretic hormone, more water is being reabsorbed. Therefore, water from the urine is being reabsorbed. Once reabsorbed, water gets out, it enters now your bloodstream. Therefore, when water fills the blood vessel of the patient, the blood now is diluted. Am I right? Giving you hemodilution. Represented as what? Decreased hematocrit. Now, what about the urine? Remember, there is water reabsor reabsorption. The urine now is concentrated because the water goes back to the system, right? So, you will have urine concentration. So, again, patient with cyan will have hemodilution, giving you hyponatremia, and urine concentration. So please do not forget these three features of patient with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Now let's discuss diabetes insipidus. Now there are also three features for patient with DI. So what are the three common features? So what are the three common features of patient with diabetes insipidus? Now number one, okay, because of hypo secretion of ADH, less water is being reabsorbed, making the blood, of course, concentrated. So you will have Hemoconcentration. So if the blood is concentrated, what do you think would be the result of your hematocrit? Answer, there will be an increase in your hematocrit. So please do not forget this. A decrease in the hematocrit would mean blood is diluted. An increase in the hematocrit would mean blood is concentrated. The second feature, because of hemoconcentration, it will also result to hypernatremia. Can you follow? So there will be an increase in the blood sodium level. Third and last feature of patient with DI, urine is what? Urine is, of course, diluted. So you will have urine dilution as supported by a decrease in your urine-specific gravity. Why? Remember, let's go back. If this is your blood vessel, again, your kidney, the output, of course, urine. Patient with diabetes insipidus, there will be hyposecretion of ADH. If there is decreased antidiuretic hormone, less water is being reabsorbed. Therefore, if less water is being reabsorbed, no water goes back to the system, the blood becomes concentrated. Therefore, hemoconcentration follows. Since no or less water is being reabsorbed, there's a lot of water in the urine, making the urine what? Diluted. Am I right? So you will have urine dilution. So therefore, patient with diabetes insipidus will have an increase in the hematocrit, giving you what? Hemoconcentration and a decrease in the urine-specific gravity that would suggest urine dilution. Can you follow? So please do not forget this. Increased urine-specific gravity would mean that the urine is concentrated. Decreased urine-specific gravity would mean that the urine is diluted. Now, in your examination, sometimes you'll be asked, what do you think is the initial test if you suspect ADH abnormalities? So it could be SIAD, it could be DI, am I right? The initial test that you need to evaluate or assess or check is the urine-specific gravity of the patient. Now, having said that urine-specific gravity is the initial test, you need to know the normal urine-specific gravity, correct? The normal urine-specific gravity is 1.010 to 1.025.
okay? 1.010 to 1.025. So please do not forget this. Syed will give you hyponatremia. DI will give you hypernatremia. Another thing, Syed, fluid volume excess. DI, fluid volume deficit. Now remember, DI, D stands for diabetes, just like your diabetes mellitus. Am I right? In diabetes, there is polyuria. In diabetes, there is polydipsia. Therefore, patients with diabetes insipidus will also manifest polydipsia and polyuria. Can you follow? Polydipsia and polyuria. Those are two additional manifestations of patient with diabetes insipidus. So this is the thing you need to remember when you talk about sodium imbalances, hyponatremia and hypernatremia. One more thing, a patient with hyponatremia because of sodium deficiency, now not this one because this is not brought about by sodium deficiency, this is brought about by hemodilution. If the cause of hyponatremia is sodium deficiency, the best solution to treat hyponatremia is your plain NSS or normal saline solution. Please do not forget that. So this is what we call sodium imbalances. Let's proceed to the second electrolyte. Okay, the second electrolyte is what we call your potassium. Potassium. Okay, potassium is an intracellular cation. Again, it is positively charged and can be seen abundantly inside the cell. Now, reminder, potassium is important for contraction, right? Muscles contract, impulse transmission. The most important thing to remember in your examination is that potassium and impulse transmission are directly proportional. Again, Potassium and impulse transmission are directly proportional, okay? Directly proportional, okay? Directly proportional to what we call impulse transmission. Can you follow? Now, why is this thing very important? Sometimes in your exam, you'll be asked, okay, the following are signs and symptoms of patients with hyperkalemia. Am I right? Select all that apply. So take note, anything... Okay, anything that is something to do with increased impulse transmission is related to hyperkalemia. Anything that is related to decreased impulse transmission is related to hypokalemia. In short, increased potassium will increase impulse transmission, giving you what? Diarrhea. Am I right? Giving you tachycardia. A patient with hypokalemia, decreased potassium, will also have decreased impulse transmission, giving you what? Bradycardia, giving you what? Colic, giving you what? Paralytic ileus. So in short, in your examination, you don't have to memorize all the signs and symptoms, am I right? All you have to understand is the relationship of electrolytes with the impulse transmission. So with your potassium, potassium and impulse transmission, they are both directly proportional. Okay, remember that this video is just a supplementary clip of the review notes, the Chronicle of Medical Surgical Nursing. The detailed discussion of these electrolytes can be seen and can be read, okay, in the review notes, the Chronicle of Medical Surgical Nursing. So this is just a supplementary video. Now, when you say potassium, sometimes in your examination, you'll be asked about dietary modifications, right? What are those foods rich in potassium? Sometimes you'll be, can you be asked, Okay, among the options, what specific option contains a lot of potassium? Am I right? And that is not that is not actually new to us. So what are common foods high in potassium? So let's talk about foods, okay, high in potassium. So when you say foods high in potassium, please do not forget our mnemonic PABOS. 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 Okay? PABOS. P stands for potato baked with skin. Potato bake with skin. A stands for apricot. B stands for banana. O stands, stands for orange. W stands for what? Watermelon. And S stands for what? Make a wild guess. P for bake, potato bake with skin. A for apricot, B for banana, O for orange, W for watermelon, and S is for what? Of course, strawberries. 
Okay? So these are common foods, okay, high in potassium. So please do not forget the relationship. Remember that there are two opposing arrows. One arrow going down and another arrow going up. So if you be asked in your exam, okay, what specific food or let's say among the options, what specific option contains a lot of potassium? So baked or potato baked with skin contains a lot of potassium, so it goes down. So from P going to the K going to S, the K potassium content decreases. Am I right? But if you start from the bottom from the strawberries going up, okay, the potassium level increases. So you will have an option, okay, what specific food okay, prefer okay, food preparation contains a lot of potassium and less potassium content. So please do not forget this, your pabos. Now, with your examination, I want you to familiarize the different ECG tracing and ECG changes for patients with potassium imbalances. So let me try to erase this part. Again, let's divide our board into two sides. Here, you will have your hyperkalemia, and on this part, you will have your hypokalemia. In your examination, very common question here will be, ECD changes or electrolyte, or shall I say, ECD changes or ECD tracings, right? So for patient with hyperkalemia or increased blood potassium level, that's your hyperkalemia, patient will have, of course, STI. Can you follow? But for patient with hypokalemia, patient will have UST. So these are actually techniques or mnemonics for ECG changes or ECG tracings for patient with potassium imbalances. So what does STI stand for for patient with hyperkalemia? Patient with hyperkalemia, S stands for ST segment. ST segment that is actually depressed. So there will be depression of ST segment. T stands for what? T wave that is actually tall, okay? Or sometimes it's peak, sorry. It's peak T wave. So tall peak T wave. And I stands for what? Interval that is actually prolonged. Now what specific interval are we referring? The, okay, the PR interval. So again, patient with hyperkalemia will have ST segment depression, tall peak T wave, and PR interval that is prolonged. But for patient with hypokalemia, okay, you will have UST. U stands for U wave. Please do not forget this. U wave is the classic ECD tracing for patient with hypokalemia. S stands for ST segment depression. And T stands for what? T wave that is flat or sometimes inverted. Okay? So please do not forget this. Hypokalemia will have U wave, will have ST segment depression, and T wave that is flat or inverted. Now, what about for medications that will be given to your patient? Now, for patient with what we call hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia, there's too much potassium. So what do you think will be Modificate, what, what do you think will be the medications or pharmacologic agents that can be given to your patient? Number one, of course, doctors will prescribe diuretics. Am I right? Now, when I say diuretics, we know for the fact that diuretics come in two forms, right? It can be potassium-wasting diuretic or potassium-sparing. So when you say potassium sparing, you give diuretic. It is an agent that promotes diuresis but conserves Potassium. So therefore, potassium sparing causes hyperkalemia. We cannot give the type of diuretic to a patient with this condition because the more it will increase the blood potassium level. The best type of diuretic that can be given to your patient is a potassium wasting diuretic. Okay? So what we give here is potassium wasting diuretic. Can you follow? Potassium wasting diuretic. So what are common examples of patient, or shall I say, what are common examples of drugs or agents okay, said to be potassium wasting? Example would be your BFHM. So what does BFHM stand for? B stands for what? Bumex. F stands for your furosemide. Can you still remember your Lasix? H stands for your hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide. 
Can you follow? Or your HCTZ. And M stands for mannitol. Can you follow? So these are common potassium wasting diuretics. Now highlight in your exam. If your patient is receiving potassium wasting diuretic, remember it's diuretic. It can cause fluid volume deficit. Am I right? Since it is potassium wasting and a diuretic at the same time, it may also cause electrolyte imbalances. So what are common electrolyte imbalances associated with potassium wasting diuretic? You will have hyponatremia and hypokalemia. Because the moment you give too much potassium wasting in excessive form, instead of correcting hyperkalemia, you will give another disorder. It will reverse the condition. So it may give you hypokalemia instead because it is a potassium wasting diuretic. Can you follow? Now what about what about aside from diuretics? Aside from diuretics, what are other drugs that can be given to your patient that will correct hyperkalemia? Allow me to erase this first part, okay? So aside from diuretic, another drug that can be given to patient with hyperkalemia is what we call your kayaxalate. Kayaxalate. Okay, kayaxalate drug. Now, kayaxalate, the generic name of kayaxalate is what we call sodium polystyrene sulfonate. Sodium polystyrene sulfonate. Things to remember in your exam. Your kayaxalate the mechanism of action, your MOA. Your kayaxalate is a form of an exchange resin. An exchange resin. Okay? And kayaxalate will be given in what route or route? It can be given PO or it can be given enema. It may be given PO or it may be given enema. Next, patient receiving kayaxalate, question your exam. What do you think is the most important or the, no, the most important nursing action before giving kayaxalate? Remember, in your examination, they're fond of giving you questions about prioritization, right? They'll be giving you questions about what will you do as a nurse if you give this drug. And this is highlighted in your exam. Please do not forget that before giving kayaxalate, it is a must, it is a priority action to evaluate or assess bowel functioning of the patient. If the bowel functioning is not good, that will render kayaxalate drug ineffective. So please do not forget this. Your priority assessment, your priority assessment is to check bowel movement of the patient. Okay? Next, if your patient is receiving kayaxalate drug, you have to watch out for what problem. So what are common conditions or problems associated okay, with kayaxalate administration knowing that it is a form of exchange resin and it will be given PO or enema? Answer, watch out for, of course, watch out for hyper, not tremia. Please do not forget this. Now, why did the patient develop hypernatremia? You need to try to analyze. Remember that this is the intestine of the patient, okay? Now, this will be the blood vessel of the patient, and the condition will be hyperkalemia. Remember, we give this drug to patients with too much blood potassium, am I right? So when we give kayaxalate, okay, kayaxalate will be given in PO or enema root or route. When we give this drug, we also administer sodium. Can you follow? So when sodium enters the intestine, remember the rule in your anatomy. When sodium gets in, potassium gets out, right? So when sodium in the body enters okay, via the intestine, the sodium is being absorbed by the system in exchange of your potassium. Remember, I said it is a form of exchange resin. So the body will get rid of potassium by absorbing sodium. Therefore, when you perform PO enema, okay, the output is rich in potassium. Why? The body absorbs sodium. Therefore, when you give kayaxalate, the body absorbs sodium, putting your patient at risk to develop hypernatremia. Am I right? Quite crazy. Why? Because we corrected the problem hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia now disappears, but your patient is at risk to have hypernatremia. So patient receiving this drug, watch for hyperkalemia. Okay, another drug that may be given to your patient with hyperkalemia will be insulin. Insulin and of course glucose. The glucose here usually, okay, they come in a form of for D50 water. 
So insulin plus D50 water. How can insulin and how can glucose correct hyperkalemia? Now, insulin, do not forget this, insulin with the help of glucose will bring potassium inside the cell. Why inside the cell? Because potassium, as mentioned, is an intracellular electrolyte. Sir, I don't get it. Expound. It goes like this. Hold on. Give me a few seconds. Okay, I'm back. So again, how can insulin and glucose correct hyperkalemia? Now look, this is your blood vessel. Am I right? And these are your cells outside. Correct? Now cells need energy. Correct? To maintain a normal cellular functioning, there must be sufficient supply of energy. And energy, okay, and that energy is what they call your ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Correct? If you can so remember in your biochemistry, carbohydrate, that's your sugar, plus oxygen equals ATP. Can you follow? Now look, when you eat, when you eat, when we eat, okay, the carbohydrate, the sugar is being okay, digested and absorbed. Once absorbed, it goes to the liver for, of course, detoxification and metabolism. The sugar now enters the bloodstream. Am I right? Now, if there is an increased blood sugar level, or you call the condition as your hyperglycemia, if the patient is hyperglycemic, if the blood sugar level is high, it stimulates our pancreas. Remember pancreas. It will stimulate the pancreas, particularly the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, to release a hormone called insulin. So please do not forget this. Insulin is being released in response to what we call hyperglycemia. Insulin serves as a key. It works as a key. Can you follow? And cell wall serves as what we call doors. Cell wall serves as doors. Remember, insulin opens the cell wall. Okay, so when, when, once the cell wall is open, carbohydrate can get inside. Why is it important for carbohydrate to get inside? Because carbohydrate, when it mixed with oxygen, it becomes ATP and energy. And cells need energy. Right? So the question here is that, what is the relevance now of your insulin and glucose with respect to potassium regulation? Most probably, you fail to appreciate that your insulin has two hands. Let's name this two hands, right? The right hand and the left hand, just a name. Let's say that the right hand carries carbohydrate or sugar. The other hand needs to carry potassium. So one hand carries carbohydrate, that's your sugar, and another hand carries potassium. If both hands carry those substances, insulin can work as a key. Therefore, if both hands carry something, sugar and potassium, that's the only time that insulin can work as a key. It opens the cell wall, dumping sugar inside the cell because sugar is an energy, and potassium inside the cell because potassium is an intracellular electrolyte. Can you follow? So let's go back. If this is the case of the patient, the patient is having hyperkalemia, hyperkalemia, increased potassium level. So what drug will be given? Doctors will prescribe insulin. Am I right? So when insulin enters the bloodstream, one hand of the insulin holds potassium. Am I right? One hand of insulin holds potassium. Another drug agent given together with insulin is actually glucose. When we administer glucose D50 water, Okay, and that D50 water, okay, is present. The other hand of insulin will hold the glucose or D50 water. So what happened? Both hands carry something, am I right? One hand carries potassium and another hand carries glucose. Then potassium, sorry, insulin can work as a key. Insulin opens the cell wall, dumping potassium inside the cell. So the question, did it correct hyperkalemia? Yes, it did correct hyperkalemia. So please do not forget this. In cases of hyperkalemia or increased blood potassium level, diuretics will be given to your patient. What type of diuretic? Correct. Potassium wasting diuretic. As said from diuretic, doctors may also prescribe kyaxalate or your sodium polystyrene sulfonate and another drug will be insulin and glucose in a form usually of D50 water. So these are common drugs or DK agents given to patients with hyperkalemia. In some cases, if hyperkalemia is so severe, dialysis will be initiated. 
Do not forget that. Now, aside from what we call pharmacologic agents, a patient with hyperkalemia, okay, there is also a need for us to modify the diet of the patient. Am I right? So what do you think will be the diet of patient with hyperkalemia? Will you encourage or will you restrict potassium-rich food? Of course, you have to restrict. Am I right? So here, you have to avoid potassium-rich foods. So what are these? Remember the pabos. I said that. Okay, another thing. If our patient is hyperkalemic, highlight in your exam, you need to avoid salt substitutes. Do not forget this. So you need to avoid salt substitutes. Why? Salt substitutes contain potassium. And another thing, if your patient is having hyperkalemia, what drug must be avoided? Please do not forget this. You need to avoid as well ACE inhibitors. Why? Remember that this drug prevents conversion of angiotensin 1 to become angiotensin 2. Therefore, if there is failure to convert angiotensin 1 to become angiotensin 2, potassium elimination is also affected. If you cannot eliminate potassium, potassium in the body retains, resulting to hyperkalemia. So please do not forget this. Salt substitutes, ACE inhibitors can cause hyperkalemia. So this must not be given to patients with existing hyperkalemia because it will just aggravate the condition of the patient. Okay, so this is what they call hyperkalemia. Now, what about for patients with hypokalemia or a decrease in your blood potassium level? So, what are common drugs given to patients with hypok? So, what are common drugs given to patients with hypok? Remember, this is a form of potassium deficiency. Remember the rule: if you have too much of something, get rid of it. Right? If you have deficiency of something, you have to supply the missing substance. Right? You have to supply the missing. Okay, the missing component. So in this case, there is a deficiency. Deficiency, sorry. There is a deficiency. Sorry, there is a deficiency in your potassium. <clears throat> there is a deficiency in your potassium. So what drug will be given to your patient? Of course, you have to give potassium. Potassium supplement. Now highlight in your exam. Potassium supplement. They come in two forms, right? So what are the two common forms of what we call potassium supplement? Potassium supplement can be given oral or can be given parenteral. So what do you call that oral form of potassium supplement? The oral form of potassium supplement is what we call calium de rule. Calium de rule. Highlight in your exam. Calium de rule is gastric irritant. Therefore, as a nurse, if you know that the drug is gastric irritant, the best time to give this drug is when, of course, full stomach. It must be given together with meal. Am I right? Another preparation of what we call potassium is potassium given parenteral root or parenteral route. And the common parenteral supplement is your KCL or potassium chloride. There are things you need to remember about KCL. Now, and what, is, and, and what are those things? Please do not forget that the maximum potassium that can be given to your patient parenteral is 10 to 15 milli equivalent per hour. Again, it's 10 to 15 milli equivalent per hour. Do not forget that. Another thing, if your patient is receiving potassium chloride, do not give potassium chloride in bolus or in high concentration. Okay? Do not give in bolus or in high concentration. Why? Because the moment you give potassium chloride in bolus or in high concentration, you will have cardiac arrest. So it is a big no-no for us nurses or any medical practitioner to give potassium okay, direct IV push or give potassium in bolus or in high concentration or more than this maximum allotted potassium concentration. So how do we give KCL? KCL is only given, okay, what? Incorporated with your plain NSS. No more. Can you follow? So K, K, KCL or potassium chloride must be given incorporated with your plain NSS. Clear? I hope so. So this will be the pharmacologic treatment for patients with hypokalemia. Now, what about the diet of the patient? Of course, patient with what we call hypokalemia, of course, you need to encourage... You need to encourage potassium, potassium-rich foods. Remember PABOS. 
So, okay, pabos. So, please do not forget this. So, these are what we call highlights in your examinations when you talk about potassium imbalances. So, this is part two, the second clip of fluids and electrolytes, wherein we talk about sodium imbalances, potassium imbalances. The next video clip, we'll be talking about calcium and phosphate abnormalities. Thank you so much, and God bless. Watch for the next video, okay? Bye!